Hey, it's R.D. Reynolds from WrestleCraft.com, and you are watching Wrestling with Regret. Uh, something that was way better and way funnier than anything on WrestleCraft.com. But hey, go there too. I'm going to try and do something on this channel today that might be one of the hardest things I've ever done. I'm going to try, try to defend Virgil. In this era of internet memes, perhaps no one in wrestling is more meme than Virgil, real name Mike Jones. In recent years, the wrestling superstar was made famous, or rather infamous, after photos began circulating online of a lonely Virgil sitting at his merch table with no one to sell to. It's simultaneously hilarious and tragic. So alone. So alone. So alone! <laughs> oh. For as long as wrestling culture has been a part of the internet, Lonely Virgil's been a steady, reliable punchline factory. Best known as the manservant of Ted DiBiase, the man spent years working for the WWF and WCW under a variety of aliases, nearly all of which were some kind of inside joke. But the jokes didn't stop in the locker room. To this day, wrestlers will talk trash about him to his face. Is there one picture of just Virgil? You would recognize it more if it was on his back like that. Because <laughs> that's, that, that's the way we saw him the most. Though it may seem cruel, it's not without justification. The legend of Virgil's lived on for years through multiple fan and wrestler accounts, often telling stories of his overall sleaziness. The one common thread is the man's incessant hustle for cash for just about anything. Do you want an autograph? 25 bucks. A picture? 25 bucks. A handshake? 25 bucks. A shout out for a YouTube channel? Well, you don't want to know how much he was asking for that. And I said, pardon me, sir. Can we get a picture with you? And you know what he said? Let me tell you what he said. He said, no. What makes it worse is that Virgil's proven himself to be a habitual liar, and a bad one at that. Over the years, he's claimed he performed at 17 WrestleManias, that his WCW deal was worth $7 million, that he was the youngest signee in Federation history, that he was supposed to feud with Steve Austin for the Million Dollar Championship. The list of falsehoods and tall tales goes on and on. Perhaps the most egregious thing he's done was to call up promoters and promise that he and Ted DiBiase would appear at an event, then call back later and say plans had changed and Ted couldn't come, all while the Million Dollar Man himself was totally unaware of his former sidekick's dealings. Seriously, of all the kinds of people whose reputations you want to try and tarnish, you go with a freaking preacher? Despite his rough handling of the truth and his endless pursuit of the almighty dollar, Old Verge has been able to keep himself busy. He's a regular presence at wrestling conventions, comic cons, swap meets, flea markets, church potlucks, subway stations, pretty much anywhere there's room for a table. He's even still involved in shows. This past WrestleMania weekend, he shocked the world at Joey Janela's spring break, beating Ethan Page while dressed as Starman from the old NES pro wrestling game. I have no idea what the context of that is, but the visual definitely fits for a Janela production. How has Virgil managed to stay relevant despite his shortcomings? Well, part of it's fed by the very same fans like to poke fun at the guy, which encourages his behavior. It also helps he's currently managed by the Megan Boys, a pair of brothers who run an entertainment company out of Canada, and who also played a role in the Iron Sheik's return to relevance over the last several years. They even helped launch a GoFundMe page to help Virgil become a million dollar man by asking fans to give him a million dollars. Sounds crazy, yes, but it's amazing what you'll do for that fuck money. I want that fuck money. I'll get them bills one at a time. So this week, I'm faced with the Herculean task of defending Virgil, and we will certainly get to that. But before that, let's go back to where it all began. Let's just get this joke out of the way first. Mike Jones, Mike Jones, Mike Jones, Mike Jones. Getting his start in 1985 in Jerry Jarrett's Continental Wrestling Association as Soul Train Jones, our hero danced his way around copyright litigation to great success in the territory. Jones even got a taste of gold, holding the AWA International Heavyweight title and Southern Tag Team Championships alongside Rocky Johnson, as the territory was an AWA affiliate. Mr. Jones eventually worked a tryout match for the Federation against Paul Orndorff and was soon off to New York at the age of 25, not 19 like he says. Well, there's also the rumor that Jones showed his honker to Pat Patterson to get the job, but that's neither here nor there. 
Either way, now the WWF had a guy who did fairly well for himself in a popular territory that was working with a major national company, utilizing a fun gimmick that got over. So what do you do with him? Well, someone's gotta play the sidekick. Clad in only the most skin tight of clothing, Jones was paired with the debuting million dollar man Ted DiBiase as the bodyguard slash manservant slash human wallet named Virgil. One of the worst kept secrets in wrestling is that his name was a rib on Dusty Rhodes, then the booker of WCW, whose real name was Virgil Runnels. It's right up there with the other worst kept secret in wrestling about Pat Patterson being, okay, I should probably slow down on the Patterson references. I didn't expect to have so many so soon. Upon debuting with DiBiase, Virgil did everything for his boss. Not only would he pay people off and intimidate passers-by, he was the chauffeur, the secretary, the masseur, the gardener, the accountant, the wet nurse, you name it, Virgil took it on. As he was DiBiase's number one goon, he was usually a distraction or a mini-boss tasked with softening up the million-dollar man's future opponent and failing at it. After three and a half years of being at Papa Ted's side and taking his abuse, Virgil had quite possibly his biggest career moment at the 1991 Royal Rumble. Despite a miscommunication in the ring, he and DiBiase beat Dusty and Dustin Rhodes in a tag match. The Million Dollar Man berated Virgil after the bell, but the bodyguard had finally seen enough. Everybody's got a prize. At last, it was time for Virgil to finally break out on his own, to be his own man, free from the figurative shackles of his oppressor. The match was set for WrestleMania, and Virgil was going to take it to DiBiase all on his own, with some help, of course. For whatever reason, Roddy Piper came along and took Virgil under his wing after the breakup. While the visual of Piper giving a seal of approval to Virgil looks great from a storyline perspective, it's pretty obvious in hindsight it was an attempt to get the hot Scott star power to rub off on this new baby face. The motive for this alliance was already about as subtle as a brick to the head, but then it truly ramped up at Mania, when Piper got his own entrance to bring out his protege who came out to no music. You can tell they're really investing a lot in this youngster. We actually see a glimpse of the old Soul Train in this match, as Virgil gets lots of shots in on DiBiase. I mean, this is insane. The fans are popping for him, they're chanting his name, but then he does the same punches again and again and again. The pop diminishes each time he takes Ted down. DiBiase eventually beats the hell out of him and the action goes to the outside, but then accidentally counts himself out after getting into it with Piper. So it's not the greatest moment, but hey, Virgil picks up a win in his WrestleMania in-ring debut, and Ted immediately beats him up. Piper tries to make the save, but his wounded knee makes him an easy target for DiBiase and Sensational Sherry. After Virgil chases the baddies off, instead of just helping Piper back up, he just tries to motivate him to get up his own damn self. What a great babyface! This feud carried on in some form or fashion for the rest of the year, reaching its apex at SummerSlam when the two fought for the Million Dollar Championship. This match had everything. A DQ finish, a restart with Sherry ejected, a ref bump, an exposed turnbuckle, Piper screaming his head off on commentary as if Apollo Creed himself was about to get killed again. Damn it, Virgil! Wake up! only for Virgil to turn the tables on his opponent. After DiBiase goes down, it takes Virgil almost a full minute to crawl to him and cover him for the win. Good God, I thought Triple H waiting forever to pin Booker T after the pedigree was egregious, but this was absurd. Who the hell was Virgil to take twice as long? Virgil dropped the diamond-encrusted belt back to Ted in November, leading into Survivor Series, when DiBiase, the Mountie, the Warlord, and the recently debuting Ric Flair went up against the team of Bret Hart, the British Bulldog, Roddy Piper, and Virgil. Man, what a dream team. Even this match had to include some bullshit finish to keep anyone from having to actually lose to Virgil, as the whole thing ended with the referee disqualifying everyone brawling in the ring, leaving Flair as the sole survivor. The harsh reality was, all these bells and whistles, all these examples of the company going out of its way to keep Virgil from wrestling a normal match for a change, boiled down to the fact that, well, he kinda sucked. Aside from his quick jabs and the occasional neck breaker, Virgil never looked that smooth in the ring. His movements outside of his punching game can best be described as that of a baby pony learning to walk. Nothing he did ever looked great. And while history has shown you can make up for a lack of entering ability with great charisma or microphone skills, it turns out he didn't really have those either. Million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, you may have all the money in the world, but you do not have not one friend except the cash. Well, Shawn Michaels, it's me and you, man, okay? I got a broken nose, I got an attitude. You need an attitude adjustment. It might come down between me and you, Rowdy Piper. Well, if it does, guess what? Lights out! Because I want to become the World Wrestling Federation Champion. Well, I will say this, he never cut the same promo twice. To be honest, it's kind of a wonder he lasted in the company for as long as he did. After the feud with DiBiase finally petered out, Virgil spent the next two and a half years as enhancement talent until he was finally released in late 1994. 
For the next couple of years, Virgil spent time away from the spotlight, bouncing back and forth between his job as a school teacher and the independent scene where nothing of interest happened. Nope, absolutely nothing wild or shocking or noteworthy or idiotic happened during his time away from the Federation at all, ever. Well, except for that. Oh my God, Big Al! What, what is that? Is well, bedtime, uh, bedtime sheets, bedtime know, for Bonzo. Uh, this moment comes from the National Wrestling Conference, a short-lived promotion that ran a handful of shows in Las Vegas and Sacramento from 1994 until 1998. We're scheduled to see a match between the former star and his rival Thug, but instead we see two men with sheets on their heads. Wrestling, everybody! After the initial what the fuckery subsides from this image, a two on one beatdown commences, and we find out that Virgil wasn't the only former champion from the World Wrestling Federation to make a bad decision in the mid 90s. Here comes the henchman! No, it's not the fun! It's Jim the Ambulance! I can't believe what, what I just there? seen, Doc! Now, besides his cheap shock value, there was no reason to have two men dressed as Klansmen beating up Virgil, a black man, in the middle of the ring. But I guess they had to find a way to justify this next spot. They try to restore some order, and they've got Virgil right on the top. Oh my God, they're choking it, Big Al. I they're can't believe what I'm seeing here. Okay, viewers, time now for you to vote on which face you think I'll make in response to that scene. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're all good ones, really. I mean, each one a classic. Okay, voting is now closed. Thank y'all for playing, and here we go. By 1996, our old friend was at the beck and call of Ted DiBiase once again, signing with WCW and joining the New World Order. Debuting as the NWO's head of security, Virgil was rechristened Vincent. Do you get it? Because, you know, he was originally named after Dusty Rhodes, and then when he went to WCW, they threw it back at Vincent Mann. Because that's the boss's name, Vince McMahon. Ah, you get it, you get it. Vincent spent most of his time wrestling on WCW Saturday Night in Thunder, away from the bright lights and greater scrutiny of Nitro. Eventually, the NWO got so bloated with wrestlers they had to create divisions within it, relegating the lesser talent to the appropriately named NWO B Team. As you might expect, their exploits weren't exactly must-watch programming, but maybe things could have been different if CFO Dollar Sign were time travelers. Perhaps my cousin Vinny's biggest accomplishments during this time were teaming with Scott Norton and Randy Savage in a six-man match at Starcade 97, as well as fighting Stevie Ray as part of a power struggle over control of the B-team, which is sort of like fighting to see who gets the first shot at having sex with a cactus, in that it provides no pleasure to anyone involved with or watching it. Stevie Ray would eventually beat his B-teammates to become the leader in April of 1999, only for him to reform Harlem Heat with his brother Booker T three months later. Glad we all sat through that then. The rest of 99 was a tumultuous year for our review topic. Months after infighting with the NWO, Vincent went to another team and got yet another name change. This time he hitched his wagon to the accidentally popular West Texas Rednecks and went by his new handle of Curly Bill. Bill would play the tambourine for the group because I guess the bass guitar was already taken. God damn it. But because they did a bad thing and got over on their own, the Rednecks were disbanded by October of that year, and soon Virgil Vincent Bill was now simply known as Shane. Working for the powers that be, aka Vince Russo before he began showing his face, Shane often teamed with Creative Control, one of the many gimmicks played by the Harris Twins. Here they were known as Gerald and Patrick. Because there's no room for nuance in the Monday Night War. Eventually, Mike Jones started going by his own name in WCW, jobbing out to other wrestlers until he was released in 2000. Aside from the occasional indie appearance, that was pretty much it for the story of whatever the hell his name is. Or so we thought. Fast forward to the spring of 2010 in WWE when Ted DiBiase Jr. was getting a little push of his own. Doing their best to equip the younger Ted for success, they tried really hard to make him a wannabe carbon copy of his dad. He was gifted the million dollar belt and even his own broken down manservant in a returning Virgil. And boy, he sure dressed up for the occasion, didn't he? Unfortunately for him, the fuck money train stopped rolling fairly quick. One month after his return, Virgil lost a tag team match to the big show and guest host Mark Feuerstein, then was fired by Ted Jr. and replaced with Maurice. The lonely Virgil meme began to pick up steam shortly after, and you've already been filled in on that. But if you don't count his appearance on the Edge and Christian show in 2016, that's the extent of Virgil's time in the spotlight. Virgil! So, here we are. The thing that I said I'd do at the very top of this video, where I try and defend Virgil. Okay, here we go. Look, I'm not gonna have fun doing this, okay?
But I mean, if you'd never seen this guy before and only had his resume to go off of, Virgil sounds kind of like a big deal. He performed during the peak of the World Wrestling Federation's heyday, a constant presence in top storylines, working with main eventers every night for years. Technically speaking, he has just as much claim to that history as everyone else he was involved with. Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Ted DiBiase, Dusty Rhodes, and tons more. Sure, he's a jerk about money, but at least he's confident what he thinks he's worth and keeps the hustle going, and it's clearly working to some extent. We all know Virgil was never great in the ring or on the microphone, but if he's as bad as everyone says he is, how on God's green earth did he stay employed by the Federation for as long as he was? Even if the rumor of him flopping his third leg onto Pat Patterson's desk were true, would that really be enough to keep a guy on the payroll for seven years? I mean, even Sylvain Grenier didn't last that long. Sure, Virgil could not get over on his own, and his abilities had a lot to do with that, but I also think bad bookings to blame as well. When Virgil turned on DiBiase in 1991, people lost their shit. He was popular as hell, but every high-profile match he won was always booked to not make him look strong in the end, and it's hard to stay popular when you don't win big matches in decisive fashion. Also, would it have killed him to bring back the Soul Train gimmick or some derivative of it? If it worked in Memphis, why couldn't it work in the WWF? Pigeonholing him as DiBiase's former manservant for an entire year really made it hard for him to avoid being typecast the rest of his career, whether or not his entering ability was a factor as well. Over the last several years, it appears that Virgil has, at least to an extent, leaned into his gimmick a bit and has taken ownership of his less than sterling rep. He knows who he is and what people think of him, but doesn't seem to care. To some degree, he is in on the joke, which makes his whole shtick that much more entertaining. I mean, have you seen his Twitter? How many trees you been climbing? I climb them every day. Watch out. Bitches. This is Virgil. I'm gonna be president 2020 of the United States of America. Fuck money. Mm. It's undeniable that Virgil is as carny as carny can get. He's constantly hustling for cash, he's a compulsive liar, he's got delusions of grandeur, but after all these years, it seems like all that stuff is just part of his charm, just part of the, the rich tapestry that is professional wrestling. And in the end, can't we just respect the man for being able to carve out his own niche in this crazy business? Do you think uh, you're misunderstood at times? Man, you can't, you can't go what people think, you know what I mean? A lot of people misunderstood Jesus, Jesus Christ, didn't they? Getting really hard to defend you, buddy. Fuck money, baby. Fuck money, baby. Green and black. Green and black. Fuck money, baby. Fuck money, baby. Like my skin is green and black. Peel it out, peel it out, peel it out, peel it out. Fuck money, baby. Fuck money, baby. Green and black. Green and black. Fuck money, baby. Fuck money, baby. Like my skin is green and black.